All right, this is scary. I'm actually set up and uh, looks like my microphone's working and the camera's in focus and I've got my computer set up and wow, weird, right? Um, that almost never happens. <laughs> anyway, um, welcome to the stream. It is Monday and I hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. Um, and uh, you got to get outside and have some fun or get into your workshops and have some fun or, you know, spend some time with your family and your friends and have some fun, fun being the main theme of this weekend past. Um, anyway, I hope you were able to do some of that stuff. Um, hopefully it wasn't like completely crashed by bad weather. There was some weather, um, some, some East Coast areas got hammered pretty bad with some bad weather and such. There was some horrible flooding in Tennessee. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, thoughts to those folks in that area, because that was horrible. Um, but that was very, very condensed area. So not a huge amount of people affected, but still horrible things. So um, the weather is a bitch sometimes and it just, you know, and it will slap you and you can't do anything about it. It's been really like here, it's been super hot uh, for, I mean, not in the hundreds, but in the nineties and humid and nasty. So I took advantage of what was some better weather this weekend for us and actually got out and um, did a couple of rides on my bike this weekend. I wanted to go to do some trail rides over to a place called Fountainhead. And unfortunately, because we've had a lot of afternoon, evening thunderstorms and rain, it was, uh, the trail was closed. And um, unfortunately, I didn't know that until I got there. <laughs> and then there's like closed sign. It didn't even say why it's closed, it just says trail closed. And I was like, well, that's disappointing. But I knew of another trail that was kind of near that area. It was about 15 minutes from there. So I drove over to there uh, after I had to repack my car or my uh, bike into my vehicle and stuff, which means taking the tire off and everything else. Um, <laughs> and I didn't look at the trail before I unpacked my bike. That would have been helpful, but I unpacked my bike, put it all together, assembled it, checked everything, rode over to the trails and blah, nothing. So anyway, packed it, unpacked it. Well, I packed it, went over to this other place, unpacked it. It doesn't have any trail closures. It, and it's also, it's mostly like a gravel single track kind of thing. So it's pretty nice. It's near, uh, it's actually on the grounds of an old prison, uh, Lorton prison. And uh, what in the world? Uh, oh, people just emailing me and stuff. Uh, I mailed out a, uh, a base or a base is being mailed out today. So that's kind of um, but anyway, so I did get some trail riding in and then yesterday, um, also, so that was on Saturday and it was a beautiful morning. And then yesterday, uh, another beautiful morning. So I hopped on my other bike. I have more than one. I know it's kind of like seems excessive, but they're for different things. So I hopped on my other bike and took a, uh, a kind of, it's not technically a road ride. It's more of a trail ride, but it's a paved trail. It's a bike biking, walking trail. Um, and rode for about 10 miles and I'm trying to build miles. I've got a trip coming up, a uh, bike packing trip. I'm going to do the, uh, the gap trail, which is the, uh, the, was it the great Allegheny passage or the greater Allegheny passage or something like that. Um, which goes from Pittsburgh to Columbia, Maryland or Columbia somewhere, not Columbia. Anyway, um, it goes, it follows the old rail trail, an old railroad line down to Cumberland, Maryland. That's where it is from, from Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland. I'm going to do that. That's about 150 ish miles or so. And then from Cumberland to Washington, DC, about another 150 plus miles, 170 miles, something like that. So from Cumberland to DC, I'm going to bike pack that whole thing. And, uh, I've already got it kind of laid out. I went on, uh, there's a website you can use called commute that I use to go and plan my rides and such. So I've got that all planned out, but it's a lot of pedaling. That's, uh, you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 miles a day, which sounds like a lot, but when you break that down to a day's worth of pedaling, it's not that bad, but I do need to get in shape for that. Cause I haven't had any 
long distance riding in a while. So it was really nice to have a beautiful morning yesterday. I went and cruised and did 10 miles and um, it was not that hard. Uh, it'll get harder once I get my bike packed up. So after I get some miles going here, then I'm gonna start adding weight to my bike and then doing those miles again because that's gonna be more representative of what I'm gonna be doing. So um, I'll probably have another, hopefully not more than like maybe 20 pounds of gear on my bike. Uh, but you know, tent, sleeping pad, sleeping bag, um, you know, there's my repair kit because you always got to have, you know, tools and such to do repairs on the, on the, on the road and, um, you know, uh, things like rain jackets and change of clothes and things like that and food because, you know, you got a food, you got to take your, my little camp stove and the fuel and the cooking pot and, so all those things kind of have to go in my bags and then go on the, uh, on the bike and that stuff adds more weight. So even though I'm like, oh, you know, this is, I'm cruising along, it feels good. You know, add a little weight, it gets a little harder. So uh, I need to build up to that a little bit. I'm gonna probably do this sometime maybe late next month. Um, I'm hoping for a weather change. I need a weather pattern change to uh, kind of take it from these 80 to 90 degree days down to 70 to 80 degree days. If I can drop 10 degrees, um, that would be super helpful. But uh, you probably don't give a crap about my bike, bike riding, do you? But hey, it's my shop. I talk about what I want to talk about. Um, anyway, let me, let me, that, so that's what I did this weekend. I did some bike riding. It was fun. I also got some shop time. I did a lot of shop time this weekend, um, but I didn't do anything fun. Nothing interesting. So what I did this weekend, let me get this out of the way. Hang on a second. I'm going to, I do. I did some uh, staining because I've got bases that need to be stained. So I did do some staining. But what I spent the majority of my time doing is standing over top of this little slab with my sander. I just stood here and back and forth and back and forth and up and down and up. I did this for, I think I probably spent, I'm going to say at least an hour working on this thing um, because sanding in grain is horrendous. If I was going to have a business where I was making in grain cutting boards, I would have a drum sander. That would be one of the biggest investments I make because you really only need two tools, three tools. Well, four tools. Okay. You need four tools to really be a production um, in grain cutting board shop. Tool number one, you need to have a table saw. I mean, you can get by with other things, but if I was going to do it, that would be number one tool. Tool number two, jointer. Okay, so I've got a jointer. Tool number three, or three, whichever way you want to do that. Tool number three is a planer because you need nice parallel boards. So you need to plane these things to get them flat. Your whole point is to get four square sides on these boards and then you start gluing everything together. But the biggest thing is number four is the drum sander. If I had, I used to have a drum sander, but I didn't, I didn't have enough adequate power to operate a drum sander because you really need like a 30 amp fuse for a drum sander or it's the only thing on a fuse. I think I only have like 15 amp breakers and I have very limited ones here. So I'm running almost everything off of two, two circuits in my garage and so which includes the lights and fans and everything runs off of two circuits so uh, i really probably could have benefited from a higher amperage because what would happen is i would run it and then i would run i have to you have to run dust collection right um i guess that'd be the fifth tool as a dust collector but anyway but you have to um you have to run dust collection with it and when i would fire those two things up i mean i would try to have my separate things but i was always popping a fuse because it just it just pulls some amperage on it. Um, but that being said, that is the perfect way to sand an in grain cutting board. And production shops or guys or gals who make a lot of these things usually, typically have a drum sander because it's just, it's just so much more efficient. You can change out the grits. You can, you can flatten with a drum sander just like you can flatten with a planer. You can flatten with a drum sander and get nice flat, parallel sides. 
um, because it has a, ba a belt that runs and pulls the material through and then the sander runs over top of that material. So as this thing is sucking through, the belt is cleaning off the top. So you can run and get these things very flat. But the big thing is you can run and change grits and go finer and finer on here and it would cut your sanding time down to minutes instead of hours because sanding in grain is is crazy. Now I did level this because you can't send this, you can't send end grain through a planer. So I did level this with my, my CNC machine, which did a great job, but it did leave tiny little marks where that, that bit passed through here. It did a little pattern where it kind of does this, you know, outward spiral thing here. And it did leave some marks. So it took me a long time to get those sanded down. Um, right now, it feels like a baby's butt. It is super smooth. A little bit of edge stuff on some of these. I need to probably hit it one more time. Um, and I will say that that's probably due to the moisture in the air um, because it is humid in my shop. It's like 53% humidity, which is a little moist because it's just one of those days again um, where the heat and humidity are back. So it's, it's a little humid in here. And just that little bit of humidity, I can tell on some of these, some of these edge areas has just soaked in and raised the grain just a tiny little bit. It, it happens. Um, what I would do before I completely finish this um, is I'll get a, a, a wet paper towel, just not soaking wet, just you know damp paper towel, and I'll rub it over the entire surface again. And that's going to raise the grain one more time, and then I'll come back and hit it with a 220 sanding pad or sanding disc. And uh, I might actually pull out a 320 just to kind of give it that really super glassy feel. But I mean, this feels like porcelain. I mean, it's really super smooth. It feels great. I also trimmed some of the edges off here because I wasn't happy with um, the edge of the glue joints. Um, I, it, there was a couple of seams where it just wasn't, and it's because it was just kind of pulled apart just a little bit. Instead of being flat like this, it was pulled just a little bit during the clamping. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to over clamp it and have it snap in places. So I just trimmed it down, but it, it's actually a good size. So that's not too bad. Um, so now we've got this inch and, well, it's about an inch and a half, give or take. It's a nice hefty piece of wood here. And I need to do something to it. I mean, it's okay. We could just kind of round the corners and put some legs on it and call it, or put some feet on it and call it a day. But that's boring. I don't like that, right? That that yeah. That just looks like a board. I mean, it's yeah, oh, it's pretty. It's got ingrain. Well, so what? Um, we need to do something else. Because that's kind of I think I pulled some in here last week to, to show that I, I like them when they have a little bit of flair to them, I'm kind of like uh, uh, office space where you know you have to have your, your 17 pieces of flair or whatever it is. If, you don't, if you're not familiar, it's a movie and you, need, you should watch it because it's really funny. But anyway, I want to add a little flair to this. Not a lot, I don't really want to go crazy with it, but I do want to, I want to add some shape to it because right now it's a rectangle and uh, rectangles are not exciting to me. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to add a just semi rounded end to each side. I'm just going to I'm just going to put a little rounded end to each side. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add a uh, a bevel all the way around the bottom, so a chamfer, if you will, to to use the correct term, a chamfer. Hey, hey. Oh, you know what? That was for me. That was UPS guy. Give me just a second. I'll be right back. I have to grab this off the porch before the pirates do.
that's the one we want. I hit the wrong button, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I've never had a package stolen off my porch, but I say that. Um, one time I had brake, brake pads and brake rotors maybe stolen. I mean, they just didn't show up. They said they were delivered and I'm like, no, they weren't. And why anybody would want to steal brake rotors? Cause they, they, unless they fit your car, why? But anyway, cause it said on the box brake rotors, but anyway, I've never had a, a porch pirate that I know of, but I don't want to start now. And that was my tent to the previous bike camping, bike camping trip. That was the tent that I'm going to be using. So I didn't want that to disappear. All right, getting back to this. Um, yeah, so I want to put a chamfer around the edge, a little 45 degree angle, which is just going to give it a nice, instead of putting handles in here, it just gives it a nice edge that you can get your fingers on. Because right now you have to have something, even with feet on here, I mean, this is pretty heavy and you don't want to have to get your fingertips under there. So by allowing you to slide more of your hand in and pick this up by putting a healthy uh, chamfer on here, I think that will look nice. Um, but the ends, I want to curve these ends. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, some people, you know, might drive in a couple of screws and then they use something flexible like this to get the angle or whatever. So you can see that, you know, bends like this and then you trace that out and whatever. That's not how I'm going to do this. I am going to use one of, let's see if I got this. I'm going to use something from here. These are a set of French curves and this is a very large Bezier curve right here. So this is the, the French curve that I'm going to use. And the way I'm going to do this is you get a pencil and I need a, I'm going to get a pencil. I'm going to get a ruler or my tape measure. And I'm going to do a couple things. First I want to do is establish what my end mark or what the middle of this board is. So eight and a half inches. So four and a quarter inches is the basically what we will call the center of this board. So we're going to mark four and a quarter inches. I'm just putting a pencil mark on here. because I want to know where that center is because I want the bevel to go up to that point. And then I had to figure out how much of a bevel do I want on here. I don't want it like round. I just want kind of a sweeping kind of, you know, a curve like that, you know, just a little curve. So I figure out how far down do I want that to go? Um, I think I'm going to use this tool right here. So I'm going to say, how about we take off maybe an inch? I think an inch look good. An inch is pretty good. So at the corners, it'll be an inch and it'll round to the top here. So we're going to go, I'm going to put a mark here that's an inch down so I can find that with my bezier. And right over here, we're going to mark it over here. And then I think I'm going to take, just to give myself room to cut here, I'm going to mark this an eighth of an inch down. And like I said, I'm just giving myself room to cut. And then, uh, oh, right there. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this curve and I'm going to put it from that inch mark up to that top and I'm going to find a nice, nice profile where it's kind of rounding because I want those to be my points. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get, this is plastic, so it's not going to hurt anything. I'm going to mark this with my marking knife so that I know exactly where that point needs to hit the edge, which is right here. And I'm just putting a scratch mark in there so that I can put that scratch mark, I can flip it, line that scratch mark up here and run that bevel up and it'll be in the same place. So let me, uh, let me draw a line here and see if this works. And, and that's the thing is if you do this in pencil, you can just kind of try some different stuff out, but I kind of like the way that this, this curve looks right here. Cause like I said, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, there's nothing, I'm not aiming for any perfection here because well, this is mine. So 
it can be whatever it needs to be and whatever I want it to be. I'm going to put this mark on this side. Make sure that we're on the pencil mark here. And then I'm just going to rotate this around till it hits that same mark there. Is that right? Yep. All right. And by doing it that way, I get this kind of, now it's not really curved, but I'll show you a little closer. So you can see the mark I put at the top, this little line I drew right there. There's a little line I drew. So that's not too bad. I kind of like that actually, because it's not perfectly round. It kind of is pointed, but rounded at the top. I could change this out and um, I mean, I could grab a different curve that was a little bit more round. Let me see here. Let me look at this one. Like I said, this is the fun part because you can just play with stuff and find out what works and what doesn't. Because I want it to be, I don't want it to be higher at any point. I want this to be the pinnacle right here in the middle, right? But this one seems to be a little short. Let me come back to this one again. Because I want that pinnacle arch, and this is a little bit, let me see right here. If I change that spot to right here, how does that change my profile? Yeah, so that needs to be right here. Yeah, I'm right back to where I started. So I kind of like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the other side the exact same way. Now, the thing is, you got to be happy with what you're doing because, oh, you know, once you start cutting, it's all done. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this on the, uh, the bandsaw. And then I'm going to take it over. I'm going to cut just outside the line. And then what I'm going to do is uh, make this right here. And I need to find uh, the center here. Um, I'm going to uh, use this one. I'm going to refine the edge over on my uh, disc sander over there because that will make life easier. So I said four and a quarter. So right here. And then we said an eighth of an inch in. So I'm going to refine this over on the disc sander. I've already got it set up over on the side over there. And uh, let me flip this around, get this edge right here. And then we will run this up to this line. Oh, that didn't draw very well. There we go. Okay, and oh, hold this down. See if this one wants to stop moving. <laughs> anyway. All right. That's not bad. I'm gonna, let me see something here. If I slide this down further, what would that look like? No, that would be too pointy. Too pointy. All right, and I'm gonna come back to this side, find my little mark here, put it on the inch. And then we will bring this up to that same line. And then draw this down here. Oh, that worked out well. Okay. There we go. So now I have um, on both sides, hopefully you can see that, I've got my line drawn out and I've got one down on this side down here. And from there, what we can do is take this over to the bandsaw and then I will just free cut this. Um, it's not a very big circle, so I can leave the the wider band <clears throat> saw blade on there that I have right now. Um, now, like I said, you could have done this some different ways. Like uh, um, you could, whoops, you could uh, get a piece of flexible wood and just bend it. A lot of people like to bend it. They'll put like, uh, they'll put some taller screws in and then they put it in there and bend it to get a more natural curve. I kind of like this. It's not like super flat and natural. It kind of has a little bit of a, that one looks more rounded than this one does. I wonder why that is. 
anyway, we're going to, we're going to cut this out and then we're going to go over to, uh, I need to move all the stuff here. Um, then we're going to go over to the saw or to the, uh, sander and make it look nicer. So I need to get some stuff set up here. So give me just a second here. Cause I had this set up for the sander. I forgot about the actual bandsaw portion of today's show. Let me move this out of the way. Is this light plugged in? It is not, but I'd like it to be plugged in. That's okay. Mm, I'm gonna put a camera over here. So I think I've got a camera set up for this actually. Let me see, there's a camera. I don't know if you can see on camera what I'm doing here. And are we crazy about that angle? Not really. We are not crazy about that angle, are we? So let's take a different angle here. I'm gonna go over here to my cameras and just grab this one that I had on the uh, disc sander, but I wasn't crazy about that. So let's go this way. Come on, just up a little bit more. There we go. All right. We'll change cameras because I think that'll be better. So let's go here. There we go. How's that? Is that better? I think it's better. I'm going to grab my ears. I'm going to grab my remote and I'm going to check my computer really quick because, you know, why not? And then we're going to uh, make some cuts. So let's make this thing a little prettier, shall we? Okay, so nothing super extreme there, right? Just just rounded a little bit, um, just to give a little character, a little something, just to take it from from boring to like this, right? So a little bit nicer. Um, hopefully, you can see that there's still. Let me see if I can pull this in here. Oh, so there's still some pencil line there, um, and that pencil line 
is what we will sand down to. So I will refine that little edge over here on the thing. So let's uh, zoom out a little bit. Oop, that's in. Let's come over here and we're gonna go right to here. And we are gonna refine that edge over here on the, uh, on the circular sander. So this is my 12 inch disc sander, uh, Harbor Freight, super, super easy, super good. Um, you know, it's one of those tools I highly recommend if you're gonna buy something from Harbor Freight, this is one that um, I would have no problems recommending because it's just, it's a motor that turns. It's really super simple. I wish it had a little bit better deck on here, but it's not too bad. Um, one thing before I get going here, I am gonna check this for square because it's pretty good. I mean, that a little, it's an aluminum table, so it can droop a little bit over time, but it's pretty good. Eh, it's got a little tilt right here. So I'm gonna loosen these. Loosen this one. And I'm gonna try to get this set exactly and locked in because you want to keep that straight, right? Because we're going to be adding that chamfer to it. And I'm going to be running this around. So I want to keep that nice flat 90 degree um, curve all the way around here. Okay, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn this on and uh, turn on my dust collection. And then I'm just going to work this profile around the edge here. It's all I'm going to do and try to get down to that line. But by putting it on here, you can be a little bit more sweeping with it, kind of work out those curves and get rid of some of those sand, uh, those uh, bandsaw marks.
So that is uh, the marks that we put on there. Um, all the end marks are cleaned off now, all those uh, tooth marks from the saw. It's a very nice, because it's on here and you can sweep it around those, those edges um, by just pivoting, um, it gives a really nice smooth corner to those uh, smooth edge. I was able to get right down to that pencil line. Um, and then yeah, I actually rounded it just a hair more because it's so easy to do on that sander. Uh, let me come back over here for a minute. Take these off. So now instead of a square, we have this, right? I like this. This is, I think this is kind of nice. Um, let's see if it's a little bit better view from this way. So that looks pretty nice. I like those rounded edges. Um, I don't know if you can see, I mean, I got right down to the pencil mark. You might just see a, a hint of pencil mark right around the edge, but more importantly, it gets rid of all those teeth marks from the bandsaw blades. And so it's nice and smooth. This side too, right there. So that looks nice and smooth. Um, we will sand this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sand this now, I think, on the edges. And then we will run this through the chamfer bit. Um, and the reason being is we'll have a thinner edge and it'll be harder to sand it smooth with the uh, disc sander if I wait till it has a thin edge. So I, I actually might do this now. Um, I mean, it really isn't that hard. I don't have to do a ton of sanding to it at the moment. Um, but before we run it through the chamfer, just to kind of clean that edge up and make it a lot smoother. So let me go ahead and just plug the power in here and the dust collection into my, uh, into my uh, sander, which is already pretty much set up over here with the sandpaper that it needs to have. I'm just gonna do like a 220 run on here just to make it look nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so if I didn't mention it, today is not gonna be a super long um, episode because I have, uh, I have to run out and run an errand this afternoon a little earlier than I normally would want to, but you know, sometimes you don't get to dictate the, uh, the times that things happen. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and just run the sander over top of this. I'm gonna sand these edges and get them nice and smooth so they feel kind of similar to this. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. This is set up with uh, 220 grit on here. I think that'll be okay for right now.
I'm going to tell you that the jury's still out on this oscillating sander as well. What? I, I kind of thought that, you know, based on my last orbital sander, that it was supposed to spin. These things almost do no spinning. They like very slowly turn. I, I, I don't know, maybe I just don't understand the way they're supposed to work. Um, well, I've got this, hang on a second. I'm just gonna run this over the top of this really quick here. Okay, and that actually just kind of took those little edges off um, that I told you about. There was like, oh, there's some little tiny edges. Now it's like, this is like a marble countertop. This thing is just so glassy smooth. Um, all right, getting on to things, we're gonna set this up on the, uh, the router table next. And I need to figure out, right now, I need to figure out what is my top and what is my bottom. Because we obviously, we don't wanna chamfer the top. We wanna to chamfer on the bottom edge. And we need to figure out what, which, which edge is that bottom edge. Um, one easy way to do that, or I won't say easy, but a good way to do that is to kind of see what it would look like with some oil on it so that you can kind of gauge which is your, your better side. Um, they're both equally sanded, so I don't have to worry about that. I'm just getting a paper towel here. But they're both equally sanded, so they should, um, they should look pretty good. I've got my naphtha here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wet this down with some naphtha and look at the sides. And this gives a kind of a, a preview of what this will look like with a, uh, an oil finish on it. Because I, I call it a finish. We're not really going to put a finish on it. We're going to soak it in oil to protect the wood and the people using it. But it will look much more like this when it's done. So that kind of gives you an idea. Um, Cause you can see here, not nearly as bold as this. So that's one side. Um, it's not bad. Let me see this other side here. All right, let's go ahead and look at this side real quick. I'm gonna put a little bit more of the naphtha on here and don't worry this stuff like it flashes off and it's gone. So not a big deal, but what it does to the wood is just give you that, it cleans it, cleans all the dust off of there pretty much. I'm getting a lot of dust on here, but it gives you that preview of how this is gonna look. Um, and I think I prefer this side. So I'm gonna make this my top. Thank you, Naphtha. I just like the way that looks. So we're gonna call that my top and um, I've got, I mean, I've got some really interesting wood anomalies going on throughout some of these pieces here, and it looks pretty cool. Um, but I just, for whatever reason, I just kind of like this the best. Let me just clean these sides off here a little bit, because they look nice when they're cleaned up. Especially this end is really interesting looking, with all the little pieces in there. But really, and that's really striking and very bold. This one's a little bit more boring on this end, um, but that's okay. All right, but it is clean now. Now that was my whole purpose was to clean this off. So I'm gonna just lay this towel out here so it can dry. Pardon me for leaning across. 
Now I need to come over to my uh, router table and set this up for action. So I'm going to move some stuff out of the way here because I was, as I said previously, doing some finishing over here, which means I have things like my finish and other such stuff that I need to get out of the way. I've got painting pyramids and my little piece of cardboard that I use and some other such things. So I'm just going to move all this stuff off to the side because I'm going to come back to that. I'm, not, I'm going to be doing those things later. But for right now, I don't need them. So I'm going to stick this stuff to the side and just stash it. And then we will uh, go to Now, I do need to put a camera over here. So let's walk over. Um, let's. <laughs> like you're going to walk over, right? I'm going to walk over and I'm going to give you a view of the router table here. So we'll zoom this out. That's a pretty good view right there, I think. All right, we will go with that. And looks like that. And then we are going to uh, set up a chamfer bit. Now, first of all, I've got two big bits here that do not belong in my pile, but this is a chamfer. It's just a 45 degree chamfer bit. Um, I'm going to put these big mama jamma bits away so they're not in the way. These are really huge. These are the half inch <clears throat> shanks. Whereas my chamfer uses a quarter inch shank. I would like to actually get a beefier one. I should get a beefier chamfer bit. But for now, this will have to do. Okay, so I'm going to take this top off. We're going to raise <clears throat> the chuck up into the air here. Well, up it goes. Now, I will start taking light cuts at first. I'm not going to just do my full depth chamfer bit on here because um, that's just a lot of wood for this to, to remove. And I don't want to stress it that hard. So I'm not going to take big bites. I'll take little bites. This is my eighth inch roundover. We are going to use that on this table as well. When we get done with the chamfer, we'll come back with an eighth inch roundover on the top. Um, and that'll give those some nice smooth edges. But for now, we're working with this. So let's set it in there. I'm going to just raise this up just a little bit. I find I get a better squeeze on the on the shank or on the tool shaft there. There we go. All right, and we can lower this down a little bit. And then I need to find a uh, cover here that's going to fit that particular one. Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure which of these. Probably not that one. This one will work. One and three eighths. Awesome. Okay. Put that in there. It just barely clears the edge, but it clears it enough that it's not going to uh, hit the blade. That would be bad. All right. Now we can lower this thing down. And then I need to look at how much, how much of a cut this thing is actually going to take in here. So really, that's pretty good. It's just about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little less, maybe three sixteenths for a first cut. And then what I will do is I will just raise this up as we go to get a deeper and deeper chamfer. Okay. And I'm going to put my dust collection hose just kind of hanging out here on the side just to kind of collect whatever I can. I need to plug in the router bit and I'm going to, I think I'm going to slow it down just a hair. It's probably a little fast. So when I turn it on, I'm also going to make an adjustment to the speed because it is a variable speed router. All right. This is my upside. We decided there's my downside right here, downside on the table. And, um, I have a little bit more of this there. There we go. Just collect that dust. All right, I need my ears and let's go ahead and start and make that first cut and see what that looks like on here. Oh. 
Okay, so the, the only fear I had <laughs> is because all of this is in grain, right? Um, you might get some chip out on here, and I'm getting a little bit, so I'm trying to go super slow on here and not get any in grain. Now, I could try to figure out where I want this to go as far as how high up, um, and then use my uh, marking gauge who kind of cut the wood fibers there so I get a clean mark at the edge. Because I'm thinking I want it to be up this high. And I could just keep raising it until I get up to that edge. So that's a little teeny chamfer on there. Let me show you how small that is. That looks like that. That's a tiny chamfer on there, All right? Not huge. It looks pretty good, but we're gonna go higher, taller. So I'm gonna get the uh, thing on here. And we're gonna raise this up a little bit. Take a little bit more. So let's uh, let's go one more pass here, see how this looks, and maybe we'll uh, change some stuff up. I'm gonna clean this up first. Looks like my son just locked my front door. You know, you gotta love an automatic front door lock because they're pretty cool. And it tells me who's coming and going when they unlock the doors. But I just looking because he said he was gonna take the dogs to work with him, but he does not have the dogs with him. He must have changed his mind. Now this one actually is a little bit cleaner right here. A little bit of nick right there. Not great, but not bad. Um, just trying to clean it. This is a little chippy right there. That's the one that I don't like that one. It's a little chippy. Um, we're getting a little closer to what I'm envisioning for this. So you can see now, and it's got a nice, so when it's on the table, it's nice area, but it's still not enough to get your fingers right underneath there. And that's what I really want is your fingers under there. I really want this to have a little bit more. How deep is this right now? 
This is um, about uh, three eighths, and I'm thinking uh, at least five eighths is what I'm looking at. So I'm going to keep raising this up. In fact, hang on a second. Let me uh, let me do something here. I'm going to set this to five eighths right here, and I'm just going to uh, get my marking gauge. I think this actually might work pretty well for this stuff because it's it's just basically all it's doing is it's catching that edge. Um, so I'm just going to set this to five eighths like that. And I'm going to use this um, to mark that line and maybe cut some of those fibers to keep it from chipping out. So I need to keep raising this up to get to this point where it will meet this line or close to it. I can maybe go a hair above it, but that's my, that's my destination line right there. So I'm just marking this in here and all it's doing is just cutting that first layer of fibers, but those are the ones that usually catch and chip up. So if you can get those cut, it'll be a lot cleaner. So I don't know if you can see my line there that I made. It's really faint, um, but I did do a line that goes across here. Now, the thing is getting this raised up to the point where it's actually going to meet that line. That's another story. So we're not there yet. Got a lot to go to get to there. So we're going to raise this up. I think it's right at the bottom is where that cutting edge is. All right, let's make, we'll just make some more cuts and work our way up there. We'll just keep raising it up and go from there. Well. Woo. Okay, kind of got a problem here. All right, I have a problem. <laughs> so that was, I raised that up too high. And now I've got a bigger issue. I've got bigger issues all along here. So I went ahead and did that route. Let me show you what I did. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. You're such an idiot sometimes. So I raised that bit up thinking, oh, we'll just keep climbing up the edge here. Problem is the edge, um, let me turn my computer on here just to make sure nobody's asking questions. Um, the edge, let me get this one here, was actually higher than the edge of my wood. So do you see where it really cut into, there you go. There's a good look. See, I've got this little wafer thin here. That means, in reality, I need a bigger, I need a bigger bevel to do this. I'm still an eighth of an inch shy of where I want to be. Maybe a little bit more. Well, yeah, how much is that? Is that like three sixteenths? Yeah, like three sixteenths away from my, from my line that I just did. And I have all this extra wood right here that I can't I can't do anything with this because it's honestly, um, this needs to go. Oh, 
Bummer. Bummer, bummer, bummer. I could have sworn that this would cut a deeper chamfer than that, but apparently I've reached the extent to which my chamfer will work. And I want to check something here. I should have done this beforehand. Um, is I'm lowering this down till it's right at the tabletop here, edge. Um, I need, hang on, I need a different ruler here. I wanna see where this is right at the edge here, because then it's gonna let me measure the height of my chamfer bit. So right, I think right there, I think that's where the edge is, right there. And that means that I can run well, shoot, I should have seen that. I can only run like a half an inch deep chamfer with this thing. And I went beyond that. Beyond that area, that's what I did. Um, so I'm gonna do something really quick here. I'm going to open another window. You can't see this, but I'm gonna see it. Um, I'm opening a window on my browser for, um, Amazon, really quickly here. Um, chamfer bit. Chamfer bits. Okay. And I need to see how big of a chamfer I can get here. Quarter, three, yeah, see, very small chamfers, but I need a large chamfer bit. Um, here's a white side chamfer bit. I can get it tomorrow. Um, but how deep? I need to know how deep of a cut. So this is pretty big. This is, uh, um, let me see here. Can you show me? Can you tell me? Uh, I can't always get, oh, it's three quarters of an inch. Uh, the thickness of the border of the chamfer is listed in the package as three quarters of an inch, but the length of the blade is directly proportional to the chamfer. So we'll cut a slightly thicker board, in this case, a 0 0.001 inch thicker than three quarters of an inch, but not an overlap, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so this one will do... This is a 45 degree bevel bit on a half inch shank. The cutting length is one and one sixteenths and the cutting height is three quarters of an inch. So honestly, I mean, where's my board here? Um, I need to see how tall this is that I've cut this thing. Cause you know, I'm almost at three quarters of an inch here, but not quite. So I am just well, I'm at three quarters of an inch, yeah. So I need that three quarters of an inch height that I get from a blade that size. Um, it is a half inch shank, which is nice. It is a uh, expensive bad boy, which is not nice. <laughs> um, but people use this for doing three, uh, 45 degree miter joints on three quarter inch boards, and it would work well for that. Um, this is a white side router bit, 2306 chamfer bit with 45 degree, one and one sixteenth inch cutting length. So the one and one sixteenth is determined by the length of the blade that's doing the cutting, not how tall that cut actually is. And that's not bad. White side bits are really good. Um, let, me, uh, let me go back and look and see if there's anything else here. That was a one and one sixteenth. Here is a two and a half inch chamfer bit. Woo, that's a big boy. Let me see what this one is. Let me see if I can see how deep this one's gonna cut here. Um, so this one, let me see, cause that seems like an awfully big blade. Let's see if I can get, I'm looking for descriptions or anything in here. Uh, usually people will ask the question Maximum wood thickness it will cut. I think this will do up to one inch. Um, so people use this for three quarter inch cuts or whatever. This is a uh, Freud, which Freud bits are not bad. Um, 
I've used, I've got Freud bits and they're pretty good. Uh, this one's 45. Um, and the other one was uh, 49, I think, for the white side. Let me see here. The white, oh, I'm sorry, actually the white side's cheaper. I can get it tomorrow. Um, uh, that's a one and five eighths inch diameter. What's the diameter in this one? See, some of them give cutting length, some of them give diameter. And those two things aren't necessarily the same. You, you need to see different tools. This is kind of frustrating sometimes, especially when you're dealing with router bits and stuff, because different tool makers assign measurement with different, um, to different parameters. So some of these, like the Freud is a two and a half inch diameter with a half inch shank. That's what it says. The white side is a one and one sixteenth inch cutting edge is what it does. It doesn't tell what the diameter is. It tells what the cutting length is. And I'm looking to see if it gives a diameter in here. Um, I think if I went to the white side bit um, website, website, it would give me a little bit more information. Um, Cause obviously the product description just gives the history of white side machines. It doesn't tell me anything about the bit. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. And in product dimensions, it's the size of the box. It says two by three by five and a half inches. Well, I know this thing's, nothing about this is five and a half inches. So that doesn't give me any answers there. Um, and, and that's kind of frustrating when you're talking about tools is trying to figure out what, you know, it's, it's the same cutting edge, right? It's a chamfer bit, it's cutting a 45, but the descriptions, are like apples and oranges. They, it's hard to compare them because they're not the same. And that's a little frustrating. Um, I definitely know that if I have a half inch shank, like this has a 5 8 inch cutting length. I don't know what the cutting length is on this one. Cutting length on this one is, uh, what is that? Let's, let's measure the cutting length on this particular one that I have here. So the cutting length on this one is, well, I need to raise it up. Let me raise it up so I can get an accurate cutting length on this one. It is, doo -doo -doo -doo. I guess I can measure it with this one, maybe. Well, this one's actually easier. Can put it right under here, put that to right to the edge. Yeah, so it is about, mm, let's see here, 87 one twenty eighths, 11 sixteenths. So it's about an 11 sixteenths cutting edge on here. Um, so anything that you did, you'd want it to be bigger than that. Like if you had a three quarter inch or whatever, um, like I said, these are really kind of just, they don't say anything. They don't, here's one 45 degree chamfer with a half inch shank. Oh, okay. It doesn't tell me the diameter. It doesn't tell me how deep the cut is. It just tells me it'll cut a 45 and it has a half inch shank. I mean, the half inch shank information is useful. But I need to know how big of a cut it's going to make. Even their diagrams that they show. Um, okay, so this one cuts a half inch thick. So at least on their diagram, and this is a uh, Yoniko, um, which I actually have some of theirs too. At least on their diagrams, they give a much better description because they all have little charts and they show little measurements along the bits and stuff. So theirs are better because they do give that information on there. Um, Here's another one, one and a half inch cutting length on a white side. And this thing is, holy crap, $83. But once again, it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, it tells you the cutting length and then you got to do math to figure out what the, the height is on here. And that's no fun. Uh, this has a cutting height of one and one sixteenths inch. So basically one and one sixteenths is the height on this one. That's more than I ever would need. That's way too, that's, that's a monster bit. We're going to chuck that one away. I need to figure out if I'm going to get the, well, I've got two choices. I could do the Freud um, with the uh, two and a half inch diameter with the half inch shank, or I can do the white side 
with the 1 and 1 16th inch cutting length with a 3 quarter inch height. I think both of these will do 3 quarters of an inch. Um, I think I'm going to go... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I can get them both tomorrow. Um, I, you know, I'm going to go white side just because I know white side, they are very good blades, very premium carbide on their cutting edges. And yeah, so I'm going to add that to my cart and then I have to go to my cart. Cart, look at my cart. I have an item in there. I have to save it for later because I've just save for later. And then I'm going to buy this thing, but I have to make sure I buy it on the right thing and proceed to check out. What do I want to buy this with? Um, I want it tomorrow so I can finish this thing. And I apologize, but we're gonna, I'm going to go put the eighth inch roundover in and we're going to finish that eighth inch roundover on here because really there's nothing else I can do um, until I get that additional bit in here to fix my oops. There's really nothing else I can do to that. So, um, I was hoping that we'd get the chamfer done, I'd get the eighth inch done, and then we'd slap some oil on here and we'd be like, project done. Project's not gonna be done till Wednesday <laughs> because I'm gonna get that chamfer bit in here and we're gonna start cleaning that up. Um, how do I wanna pay for that? I need to change that to my business card, which is, I have to look at my numbers here. That one, okay, so this one, and use this payment to that address. Deliver it tomorrow, please, thank you. I mean, here's the thing. Could I go to Home Depot and look there? Yes, do I know that they don't have one? Yes, their bit selection is very limited. They don't have anything specialized, all of their stuff at Home Depot and Lowe's, pretty much any place like that, they're very specialized and those, those products are for the general woodworker, which means they're the basic assortments of router bits that you get. The quarter inch, half inch, three eighths inch roundovers, you'll get the, maybe the Roman OGs, you'll get a, a chamfer, but it'll be like the size that I have here, which is a small chamfer. So it's not gonna give you the, um, it's not, they're not going to have specialized bits like this. I could go to Woodcraft. They might have one in stock. Um, they carry a much larger assortment. Um, but I, I'm, I'm still going to say I doubt it. Um, let me, let me just check here something real quick. Okay. I was just checking to make sure nobody's commenting or adding anything to it. Anyway, I found that none of these places really, um, what, oh God, come on. Where am I, there we go. None of these places really have what you want. Um, Woodcraft maybe, and if, you're, if you've got a specialty wood place, um, Rockler, Woodcraft, something like that, even maybe a, if you've got a really good hardware store, um, they might, but uh, let me, Woodcraft. Let me check Woodcraft and see if they actually have this bit. Um, which bit did I get? I, did I get the uh, allow? I think I got the, uh, I wanted to get the number here. 2306 chamfer. Um, I'm going to try to look this up. 2306. There it is. Um, and then see if they have it. It says, oh, it's in stock but check in-store availability, which is what I would need. And it says only a few left, call to verify. Problem is this place is 45 minutes in the other direction. And what is the price on this? Uh, oh, it's the same price. It is the same price. Um, oh, okay. Here's the deal. I'm gonna hold off on the, I'm gonna hold off on the Amazon order. Because I have to run, like I said, I have an, uh, an errand that I have to run a little bit. Um, and I got to leave here at about one o'clock um, to go run my errand. And I think when I'm done with that, I can swing by the Woodcraft store and check to see. It says they have a few left. I, I can check by 
If they don't have it, I'll hit the buy button on, um, on Amazon. If they do have it, well, awesome. Then I'll have it this afternoon instead of tomorrow morning. And you know, that saves a little bit of the carbon footprint because, well, not really. Somebody would be delivering it to me or I would be going to pick it up. I'm going to use it. Gas is getting used either way, but, um, well, this is kind of frustrating for me for the day. Anyway, um, that's my solution. I'm going to go buy a larger chamfer bit. And the nice thing is it's not like I'll never use it again. Um, cause I will, I'll use it on different projects and stuff, but that just, I'm so stupid that I didn't check that. I was just like getting into it. Like, Oh, let's just keep cranking this up. Always thinking, right? Always thinking that's okay. You know what? Things happen. I'm going to unplug my router because that's the safe way to change bits is to unplug your router. And we are going to take the lid off here and I'm going to raise this all the way up. Oh, hang on. I have to go down and let it go. Click, click, click. There's the click. And I can come all the way up. There's something that catches in here. I'm not sure what, but something catches when it does that. But anyway, I'm going to take this up. I'm going to take this bit out because since I had the router here and I'm doing stuff, um, I might as well put the eighth inch back in and then I can uh, go ahead and do the top roundovers because that's just really simple. It's just nice and smooth. And so take that bit out, put this bit in. Lock this back down. I do love my router table though. If you don't have a really good dedicated router table, man, you are missing out. You can do all this by hand, but I wouldn't want to. Uh, it's just so much better functionality doing it like this. It's so nice getting like precise measurements and stuff. And you just, you know, I lower it down and it's all good. All right, hang on. So I had some extra, extra wood chips down in there that we're not adding anything to the project. So we want to get rid of those. We're going to lower this down. Put my guide back on here. So one thing we want to do now is we want to get this set up to the right size. Why? Oh, it's not down enough. I'm like, why well, want to go in? Because it wasn't down far enough. There we go. That's close. Now I need a piece of wood just with a edge that I can check right here is one. I'm just going to check, get this lined up on there. That looks pretty good. I'm going to do a test cut on here really quickly just to check that edge, make sure that it looks good. And then we will do the perimeter here around the top. So that's not going to change. That's easy peasy. We can get that done and then, yeah, we're kind of hosed for the rest of the project until I get that bit. So let me get this uh, plugged back in and uh, then we can make a cut. I'm also going to turn the speed up a little bit.
Okay, well, I did get the roundovers done there, which is nice. Um, that was supposed to be one of the last steps we were going to do. Um, and they will need to be dressed up a little bit because, like I said, whenever you, whenever you cut, um, whenever you cut on uh, end grain, it just really hard to get a really super clean end grain cut. But that's pretty good. Feels nice. Um, it looks good. So uh, just that little round over on the corners there, you can see that it looks really nice on there. It's just nice and smooth. Um, and it just gives a nice feel and a nice touch to the project. And that's what I'm after. What time is it here? 1230. This is gonna be a short one today because I really don't want to jump into anything else today. I, I've got about the only thing I could do left today is to stain one of these bases. Um, because I really, I don't have anything else to do until I get that bit. This was, I had this all planned out because, you know, I, I'm so super smart. I just planned it all out. It worked out so well, right? Anyway, it is what it is. But man, I'm kind of scruffy today, aren't I? Kind of scruffy. All right. What am I going to do? Uh, I do have my bases here. I could do another, I guess it's so hot out here. It's like 80 degrees. It just sucks. Um, it's so warm. You know what? We're going to pull a plug. It's Monday, and I just don't feel like struggling on a Monday. Um, you know, I don't have an assignment. I, usually I do two and a half hours for these things. Today, we're going to call it an hour and a half and call it a crappy day, but we're going to fix this. I guarantee it. We will fix this. Um, I might, because this doesn't take that long, I might wait until, I might wait until Wednesday to fix this with you all here so that you can see me fix my screw up <laughs> with a new, well, it's not, it's not really fix my screw up as much as complete the process with the proper tool. I think that's what we're looking at here because I do need the proper tool to do this. And I don't own the proper tool right now. There's no way, if I was just doing these edges, that's easy. I could flop my blade over on my table saw, cut a 45, life is done. I could cut it on all sides. But because we did these rounded corners right here, because this is a rounded profile, um, we cannot, cannot <laughs> use the table saw. There's no way I'm gonna get that cut on a table saw. Just, there's no way. Um, if it was a straight edge, absolutely we could cut this all day long with that profile and it would work out fine. But it's not and we can't. And so you know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna move on with our lives. I wonder if I did a 45 right there where that would cut through. I'm just joshing with you. Um, that would be interesting though. It would be kind of an oblong 45. That was interesting though. Huh. So I'm trying to think, because that 45 would not make it to the edge. That's interesting. Ooh. I'm just thinking out loud here. So if I put this on the table saw, like this, all right, and I made it so that that table saw blade came out right at my chamfer mark here on this side, where would that intersect? Where would that intersect with the wood here if the cut was coming from here, not from this edge, but from this edge right here at the point? We've got 45 from there. Um, I can actually sort of try to visualize that by using this at a 45 degree angle, right? If I can find out which way I have to have this thing like this. So at a 45, um, I'm trying to get it so I can run it. I made it this way. There we go. So from this way, so that 45 from the very top. So I would have to hold it and look to see where that would cut. Um, I need to get this like perpendicular. So to right, oh, but it would go to right there. 
Yeah, see that 45 from there would not even cut to this edge. So that's not, that's not gonna work. If I took the 45 up higher, it would, but like I said, because I rounded this because, you know, it has to be special because I made it special. Anyway, table saw is out of the question. Not gonna work. Uh, chamfer bit's pretty much my only way to fix this. And so I'm going to, like I said, I have to go into Fairfax, which is 35, 40 minutes from my house uh, to do something. And then when I'm done there, I will run down to Springfield, which is where the Woodcraft store is and uh, around the Beltway, for those of you who are familiar with the Beltway. Uh, I will go to the Beltway route and hit the, uh, hit the Woodcraft, check them for that particular bit. If they have it, which I always like it when they say, few in stock, call to make sure. And it's like, I'm already gonna be in that area, so I'm not gonna call. Um, and if it's not there, I'll just hit buy and hopefully it'll get here tomorrow and I can clean this all up. So, yeah. I should, I should stain another base while I'm just standing here, right? Should I do that? I mean, you guys are here. Do you want to watch me stain a base? It's very exciting, I can tell you. It's a lot like watching paint dry, except it's not drying. We're actually putting the paint on. Uh, let me move this over. I do have the stuff here for it, so I could set that up really quickly. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, let me put my stuff here. I'm gonna do one because you know what? I can't sell them if they aren't finished, right? That's my philosophy. Finish these things, get them out the door, get them into the hands of people who want them. So here's another one right here. Grab one. Which one do I want? I want this one right here. This be the one I want. Um, this is the one I want. Okay. I do need to clean this up uh, because it. I don't think that it it has been hit with the naphtha. So I'm gonna clean the uh, the base off here. Let me see if they, now you can sort of see, that's a good camera angle here. So I'm gonna clean this off real quick. I'm just gonna take my little towel here and I'm gonna clean the wood surface to, and it'll dry pretty quickly too. And that way we can um, apply the stain. I always like to clean the wood surfaces before I stain them just to get any dust and debris off of them. Uh, I'm gonna set this on here to dry. Actually, what I need to do, one quick thing here, I'm gonna lower this bit down and then change that out to the flat surface because I do not want this to get in the way and I don't want like anything dropping down inside into the workings of my router table. So I'm just gonna grab the um, the closed top right here. This has a closed top to it. There's no hole in it. And then put that in here. And that makes it a little bit more like a tabletop surface. There we go. All right, so I've got that one drying and I'm gonna keep uh, cleaning this off. And uh, this should look really nice. That looks really nice, right? You like that? Looks nice. I should do one of these in just a, a, a Instead of staining it, I should do it in a, um, like a cherry Danish oil. I think that looks awesome. I should do one of those. I bet somebody would like that. I don't think everybody needs to have a, you know, super dark base. And you know, the other thing is that I am the creative director here. <laughs> because these are not custom orders. I can pretty much do these however I want to. Um, and I usually do them in the dark because it's kind of a traditional color. It looks kind of like a maple or something, or not a maple, a, a walnut when it's finished with the dark stain. Um, oh, I didn't do the inside, did I? But uh, Get in the corners here. The corners are the hard parts on the insides. 
but I do love doing a uh, a Danish oil finish. And I, I particularly like the Danish oil on cherry, um, especially if you get the cherry Danish oil. I think it adds kind of a really nice, I don't know what the color is that you would call it, kind of like an amber, a deep amber hue. Let me see how much cherry I've got here. I think I'm getting low because I've used the cherry quite a bit. Let's, is this my cherry? That's natural. Where's the cherry? Oh, I actually have quite a bit of cherry. You know what? We're going to do this. We're going to make this one. I've got two more that I can do in a dark one, and I've already done another one in a dark. Um, we're going to do this in a Danish oil because, I, like I said, I really like the cherry Danish oil. This is Watco. It's in cherry. Um, I just love the way this looks. I am going to get my fan out here, though, and we're just going just gonna to have this fan pointing at my back just so I don't sweat profusely out here. It's just about 81 degrees in my shop. It's a little warm. I don't need the dust collection right now. We're just going to stand here. I've got to let this stuff dry. Now, I can accelerate that by holding it in the fan and letting it dry down. Um, that usually flashes that stuff off pretty quick when you have a fan blowing at it. Um, I do need to get some gloves. I'm going to get a little cup and I find that it's easier. Let me move this out of the way. I find it's easier when you're doing the Danish oil stuff. If you just kind of pour it into it's just a disposable cup, just a, a little teeny disposable cup, but I pour some in here. It's just easier to dunk a rag into than it is trying to pour it on your rag and then use it. I just find it's a little bit easier of a process doing it this way. So the way the Danish oil works, and you know, they have their directions and such, but what I find is the way that it works best is to um, put a coat on, let that coat sit for 15 minutes, it'll soak in, Come back 15 minutes later, put another coat on, let that sit for a few minutes, then wipe it off, and you're done. That's pretty much it for the Danish oil. There's nothing else that needs to be done. You do have to do two coats, um, but that's not a big deal because there's no, uh, unlike stain, stain's a little bit more of a pain in the rear. And this is why I kind of said, I want to do one of these in, in the Danish oil. Stain, you have to um, apply the stain. You can't apply it to the whole thing. You have to apply the stain in areas. Then, you know, it sits on that area for a period of time. Then you have to wipe it off completely and then move on to the next area. It's very time consuming. Um, and depending on your humidity and everything else, it, it, you, you may have to attend it faster or let it dry slower or, you know, not dry, but, you know, sit for a little bit longer. It really depends on what the, the heat and humidity is like I find when it's really hot with the stain I use, uh, you know, they say, oh, let it set for like three to five minutes. If I wait five minutes, I'm not wiping that stain off. It is going to be horrible. It's going to be dried and almost impossible to get off. So I pretty much two to three minutes is all I can leave that stuff on. And that means by the time I get to the end of the area that I put it on, I'm going back to the beginning of the other area to already start wiping it off. Plus, it takes a lot of towels and things like that to do. It's just kind of a pain. I mean, it beautiful finishes, but it is kind of a pain to work with. That's why the Danish oil, when I can use Danish oil, I am a happy camper because it is just, it's a beautiful finish. Now, this has a really kind of a rich color to it. Um, it's kind of a rust. I, I'll go with rust. It looks like rusty water is what that looks like. Um, but it is a really good method of, of applying a finish. Um, remember that Danish oil has varnish in it. So if you didn't want to add any other top coat to it, if you did a couple of coats of Danish oil, you could leave it and it would still be semi-protected because it has a varnish in it that is going to be soaked into the wood fibers and add a level of protection. One of the reasons I like it. Now I always top coat mine. Mine always get a lacquer top coat, but you don't have to do that. Um, I'm going to make an application pad here 
I'm just gonna take one of these paper towels and I'm gonna fold it up and just like this so that it'll fit in my cup. And I'm gonna start with this lid right here, okay? And I'm just gonna soak some in. You can see that's like a rust color on there, right? And I'm just gonna apply it on here, but this is what it does to the cherry. It just, oh, looks so good. It looks so freaking good on this cherry. So I'm just gonna coat this up here and then I'm gonna set this on the little stand and let it soak in. Just making sure that I'm gonna get a really nice saturation. That's the other thing on this stuff is it's like, it's like water and that it, you just, or oil, you just, it is oil. You just coat it on and you just let it suck into the wood. You don't have to do anything else. Um, for, you know, like I said, 15 minutes, you come back, you wipe it up, you do it again, you let it sit for a couple minutes and you wipe it off. But the big key is to make sure you're getting it soaked in. But, um, so here's the difference. You can see this compared to this same wood, but this adds a really pretty tint to it. I just, I love that. All right. I'm going to set this over here on this little platform here. I've got some nails sticking up out of there and that helps. Um, I'm gonna, here's the other thing I like to do. Just pour a little on here. Beep. There we go. I just poured some on here. I'm just gonna swirl this around. Um, it doesn't do much for the plywood. It gives a little bit of color, but um, I just, you know, I always color the plywood. I don't have to color it on the bottom, but I always end up doing it just because it would look kind of strange to me if it didn't have something done to it. But I make sure that I get all of the cherry wood on here. Um, I've done several projects, cherry projects, where I've used this for personal stuff. And I just, it is my favorite go-to finish for cherry. I mean, I know some people like the dark finishes and stuff. Um, I just really like this. My whole desk, um, office furniture is made with this stuff or, or in this particular color and it is my favorite. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and do the sides here, get those done and then I'll do the inside cause that's easy to do. But, uh, I'm just rubbing this stuff in. It's pretty much it. You can see where I've rubbed it in and where I haven't, but that's just, I love that rich color. It just looks to me that is, that's cherry. When you say cherry, that's the color I think of. Um, is this just rich, kind of rust colored? <clears throat> that is cherry to me. I'm gonna go all the way around the perimeter here. Get it soaked in. Now, if you remember, I've got some ingrain here, so it might take a little bit extra in those ingrain areas. And I just make sure I dab it on pretty thick here. And then I'm gonna come back to this side this but this is why i like it it's just it's just simple it's easy to use you just rub it in like this i'm gonna get these end grain areas here that's it that's all the sides done and you can see it's just it's just beautiful it accentuates the grain so i mean look at how the grain looks in here i don't know if you can see that but it just it just makes the grain look beautiful oil does that anyway but look at look at that i mean come on that's gorgeous right Right? I don't care if you agree with me or not. I think it is. I think it is. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish the top of this. And then it's going to need to sit for about 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to get this whole thing rubbed in here like this. Fill all these little nooks and crannies. That's the other thing too, is you just get a whole bunch on here and let it soak in. And it just kind of fills into all the areas with a stain you have to get the brush and kind of really try to get those corners done and it's much harder to do on here i just squeeze a whole bunch into the corner and it fills it in and you don't have to do anything else now i'm just right here there we go that little slot there and i'm just going to squeeze a whole bunch into this little nook here and then you just kind of dab it back out it's no big deal but that looks great and then I will do the interior spaces and then we will be done putting this on. It's, I mean, it's that fast. I would still be working on the 
one side of this if it's a stain. Um, stain is just a slower work process. Like I said, it's, it's a different result, you know, so you have to put the work in to get the results you want. But um, I just enjoy, I enjoy the Danish oil. Is, it is much more pleasurable. And then, you know, what? I need some of those corners and I'm just going to squeeze this into the corner and there we go. All right. So all of the sides are done. Now the only thing left for me to do here is the bottom and I'm just going to pour some in. I swear this looks like rusty water. That's exactly what it looks like. But we'll get this all inside here. We'll let it sit and it will soak into the plywood and everything else. Make sure I get this corner right there. There we go. All right, that, my friends, is a Danish oil in cherry. And I think that looks spectacular. Now, to give you just some reference. I'm just going to clean, let me clean my hands off here because I don't want to get any of this on another base. But um, let me just bring one of these over just to show you really quickly for reference. That's the color difference that using that cherry makes, right? So um, it's pretty significant. Pretty significant. But I just love the way that cherry looks, man. It is beautiful wood. And um, there's no doubting, oops, didn't want to do that, that it's an easy finish to apply. So really, if you've got a towel or a couple of towels, you can put on a Danish oil finish. Um, and Danish oil comes in lots of different colors and stuff. There's a natural, so if you want to preserve the color of the wood, a lot of people like to use the natural on like walnut and stuff. I prefer to use the dark walnut on walnut. It just gives a little bit more darkness to it. But um, yeah, sand your wood, shake the container, flood the surface, and... Um, says, let's see here, hang on. Flood the surface, wipe surface completely dry, ready for use in eight to 10 hours. Oh, wait a second. Allow to penetrate for 30 minutes. There it is. So applying additional finish, it says, uh, it's kind of dirty and messy here, hang on. Flood surface using a rag, applying additional finish to the to areas to absorb all of the liquid allow to penetrate for half an hour so basically we gotta let this sit for 30 minutes it says then reapply allowing an additional 15 minutes of penetration wipe surface completely dry ready for use in eight to ten hours so basically after eight to ten hours you're ready to use so i need to what time is it uh, 12 48 um i need to uh Probably finish this up. I'm gonna take these gloves off. Ready for my party trick? There's my party trick. Um, and then I will come back and maybe apply another one. Now, whew, like I said, I like to uh, put a top coat on this stuff. So I will let this cure for several days after top coating it and it'll be awesome. That looks, that looks fantastic. I'm sure somebody will love the way that looks and that'll sell. Um, it's odd sometimes trying to figure out what people want and what people like and what's going to sell and what isn't. The things that I sometimes think are like, oh man, these things are going to fly off the shelf and they sit there forever. And the things that I think are like, oh, that's kind of oddball. I hope somebody likes it. Man, those are like the first ones to go. So I, I still haven't figured all this out even at this point in time. But anyway, uh, what I do know is I'm going to go inside. I'm going to do a couple things. I got to get ready to go in a little bit. Um, because it's going to take me a few minutes to get where I need to go. In fact, let me uh, let me just get a time reference here to see. I can do that. Hang on. I can just put my de destination in the maps. 
uh, that one. And directions. An hour and 39 minutes, what? Why in the hell would that be an hour and 39 minutes? You've gotta be kidding me, where does it think I am? An hour and 36 minutes, is there something going on that I don't know about? It's saying it's an hour to, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it by bicycle. I was using this on my bike this weekend. I was like, there's no way. Um, yeah, it's, it's a half an hour to get there. So I was like, there's no way it takes that long. But if I'm on my bike, it would take that long. I could try it. There's no safe way to do it on my bike. Um, there's no safe roads. I do not like riding on the roads. Especially we've got twisty, windy, through the woods stuff, and there's people who ride their bikes there, and I'm like, you all are crazy. It takes one person just like looking at their phone or doing whatever to come around the corner, and you're a bug on the windshield, so no thanks. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bolt out of here today. I know this is a short one. We'll come back Friday. We'll fix this mess that I started today, <laughs> and we'll put some oil on there. We'll make this thing look gorgeous and um, put a bow on it and finish it up because, you know, celebrate my idiocy with hopefully a finished project. And then this will be done and I'll move on to some other ones too. So uh, I need to figure out what I'm gonna do after this. I've got other things going on. We need to figure it out. I may, I might do something weird and different. You never know. So anyway, come back and see me next Wednesday. I appreciate it if you didn't stop in. Um, if you could hit the follow, like, subscribe, whatever is appropriate for the platform you're on, I would deeply appreciate it. If not, it ain't no big deal. I hope you had a, a good time while you were sitting here. And uh, yeah, I'm out of here. Take care of yourself. Take care of your friends. Take care of your family. Get outside. Do something fun. I will see you on Wednesday.